it's just as scary being up here as it looks. Uh, so my thesis on product strategy, which I'm going to deliver in the next seven minutes and 30 seconds, is that it's mostly around saying no. Version one of a product is actually the easy bit, because when you've got nothing else going on, you can literally do what you want, and it's usually easy to, to start good. The hard part is staying, staying, keeping your product really good, and also having to say no to all of these new forces that come along, presuming you have actually built something worthwhile. So if you've never seen traction before, this is what traction looks like. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> and it brings with it a few friends. Your vision tends to expand for your product as you realize you have a business. And then you start to get competitors. That's the best bit. And then you also start to get other things, like you know, maybe you raise some money, and that gives you a few board seats. And now you've got other people who are interested in your product. And then you grow a team. And usually last to the party are the tech industry, who will come along and start writing about what you should do. And all of these things aren't inherently a problem. What happens is you get, as we say in San Francisco, like things we should like totally build. And V1 is easy, because it's just what the founders want to build. But then you start looking at what the competitors have now. And now you've got, what are our customers asking for? Or, what are our boards or advisors or mentors or whatever asking for? And then what does our actual product team want to build? Because they have ideas too, and we shouldn't ignore them. And then what does the press say that we're going to build next? And then also, what do Forrester think? They're always good for a laugh. And then uh, <laughs> what do our biggest customers want to pay us more for? And if you actually go with all that, you build this, the file matrix. <laughs> but like, the file matrix is actually a glib example. What you actually end up with is something more like this, right? Like, which is like the ultimate toolbox for all your needs. Is, and that's how you end up marketing it as well. What this here is a, a collection of tangentially, barely useful things smashed together. And products end up there if you don't say no to things. If I pull this out in the middle of a knife fight, you'd laugh at me, right? Uh, so it, it's not a good knife. It's not a good saw. It's not a good anything. But you know, that's what happens when you basically trade off. Gaul's law tells us that you can't design complexity. You, you, everyone starts off beautiful and simple and then evolves to complexity. And you even see this happen. Here's early Windows Media Player. They had it right, a play, pause, and stop. Then they're like, let's manage your media. And they just went for it. And like, you see this happen over and over again. Like, here's Outlook back in the day. I mean, I think I was like 17 or something. Like, this was beautiful. Now Outlook's getting like this. And just as a frame of reference, here's Dance Dance Revolution, right? <laughs> and, uh, So there have to be a thousand, this is Apple's at words, there are a thousand no's for every yes. And that's roughly the right ratio. You'll be inundated with reasons why you should build things and why this is a great idea. But unless you're willing to stare good ideas in the face and say, that's a brilliant idea, thanks for bringing that to me, but we're not building it. Unless you can do that, you're going to end up with like Dance Dance Revolution. Apple claimed they throw away better products than most people launch. And they're probably right, but it's an easy claim to make, right? They never have to actually back it up or anything. Um, but like, you'll get so many reasons why you should build it. But Des, look, this feature is going to increase our engagements off the charts. And I say, yeah, well, will it increase our engagement or does it just move engagement around? Because most of the time when you ro roll out a new feature, it's just people stop doing something else. And now they're doing this instead. And then you've just split your, your engagement. You haven't actually increased anything new. But a second question for that is, is all engagement actually good? Like, we could put like Tetris into our web product. And <laughs> now people are in it every day all the time. So we're like, funding. But like, that's how it works. Or, but Des, it's a small feature. And we've all told ourselves this lie at some point. Of course, it's a small feature. Look, at it's tiny. And then at some point, you're like, boom. Because it's like, oh shit, we have to update the docs, the Android app, the iPhone app, the API, the product help, all these sort of things that tell everyone on the team. But even if it was a small body work, that's no reason to do it. Scope isn't a reason. I could go out and rob a bank right now. It would be a pretty small amount of work. But like, imagine I turn around to my CEO and I'm like, hey, look, I robbed the bank, but it was pretty quick. You know? <laughs> or another classic is like blackmail from your customers. I'm going to leave unless you build this product. And you're like, OK, you have to be willing to say, OK, off you go. Or another one is like, everyone's asking for it. OK, sure. This is what I call the frequency bias. And by the way, you're all suffering from this right now. You think everyone's asking for something because you hear it a few times at this conference. And it's like frequency. It's, you hear it frequently and recently. And now you think it's a must have. A dude was talking to me in live chat today. And I was literally on my phone saying, guys, we need to build. Stop. We don't need to build live chat. You know, it's just, it happens to all of us. It's just totally natural. But Des, we can make it an option. Not everyone has to use it. Yeah, boom, here's our options. <laughs> We've got seven pages of options of every type of thing. Now, everything gets inherently the obvious cost with this. You have to build all this junk, and then you have to try and get people to use it, and it confuses the hell out of customers. But if you recall what Bob and Chris were talking about yesterday, like, one of their best strengths they, they bring is like, that they take junk out of a product just so people can use it. And that's literally, if you go down the whole, oh, we'll make it a feature, you're walking right into that path. You can't market a product that's so big. 
but Dad, we've nothing else to do at the moment. <laughs> and this is the idea here. You've got the team here, and we just don't know what's coming next. And I'm like, I don't care. We're not building junk. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean, right? This is when you fix bugs, make your product faster, reliable, things people actually care about. You know, like, as I said earlier, like the, the devil runs UX workshops for idle hands, and he comes up with bad features, you know? <laughs> oh, but Des, 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 Des. All our competitors have this, so we have to do it, right? And I see this all the time with the startups I work with, like, the competitors have projections, distributions, revenue, metrics, alerts, and all this sort of stuff. And they look at that, like, someone looks at it, and like, we have to build it all. But meanwhile, the competitors are looking at their feature and going, no one uses this, this one's broken, this one never made sense, this was, we just did this one to keep that dude happy, but we shouldn't have. So while you're busy copying all their junk, they're busy trying to work out a way to get rid of it. You're delivering yesterday's broken technology tomorrow, or like, <laughs> like, you're like, it's like, that Wayne Gretzky quote, where, where skating to the puck was never going, you know? Uh, so good questions to ask before you say yes is, does this fit the vision? Is it a forward step along the way? Like, we could integrate with fax and intercom, but it wouldn't be a forward step. Will it matter in five years? Uh, will it generate actual new engagement, not just, you know, like, push a bit around? Can we grow the business because of it? So if this succeeds, do we actually get anything from it? Can we design it such that for people who use it, reward is actually better than effort? Does it benefit all the customers? And if it succeeds, can we even support it? Like, so we could just build an Android app, but we don't have Android people, so how do we support it? So product strategy 101 for me is this. All of the people, all of the time, none of the people, none of the time. Plot out your features on a map like this. It takes very little time. A couple of SQL queries and you're done. An easier way to do it again is, what percentage of our customers are using these features? In this case, we can see this is like a typical project management type app. Chat room and calendar, no one's using them. So we have to look at ways to either get people using them or get rid. It's like fish or cut bait. This is how you maintain product market fit. So when, you're actually talk, when, when you have time to lean and you don't know what new features you're betting, work on increasing the frequency of who's using, uh, how often people are using it or who's adopting it, how many people are using the feature. That's how you'll actually pave your way towards a great product. That's pretty much everything I know about product strategy, I'm sorry to say. But uh, I hope you found it some way useful. So uh, that's everything. Thanks very much.